Catherine Shabilska, and I'm a violinist with the Minnesota Orchestra, and also play in a group called Acoustic Acclaim. I first heard about Matt Whaling from a violin maker, and he was raving about the wonderful workmanship and beautiful tone of these bows. A bow modifies the sound coming off a violin. It can accentuate what's go what, what is good in a violin. You can try to diminish what's not good in a violin. It's always a tool of the musician, and a better made bow has more possibilities for coloring the sound that's coming out of the violin and allowing them to be an artist. There's a lot of just tiny little steps that have to be really meticulously done, and that suits my personality well, to really be able to go into those little steps and try to do everyone as perfect as is possible. The process of making a bow involves getting really, really good materials. It's like cooking. You can only be as good as your materials. The wood that's used for bows is called Pernambuco, which comes from Brazil. It's a great density. It's also a wood that has a sort of an innate vibration to it. You can just sort of feel this thing going zing. If, and sometimes it goes zing, and sometimes it goes zong, and sometimes it goes bong, which works really well in trying to tailor a particular bow to a particular musician and what their instrument needs, that you can feel what the wood feels like in a raw state and really get an idea of what it's going to end up sounding like once you've got the entire bow done. I take the wood, I cut it into the general shape of a bow and let it sit for at least five years. When it went from being in a plank inside a tree and inside a plank, it just sort of has these internal tensions. And once it gets out, it's allowed to release those tensions. You know, I'll have pieces of wood that, are, that have been sitting here and I can just sort of see how they're getting to be what they want to be. There's only so much of my will that I can impart onto the piece of wood. I have to work with what the bow is and what it wants to be. No, I haven't always been making bows. I have a degree in chemistry from the University of Minnesota. Before that, I'd been making guitars in my parents' garage since about seventh grade or so. I'm also very involved in music in other ways. I've played Irish music for a long, long time. I had a job as a research chemist. I didn't realize at the time that I really did hate my job. And in 1994, I started trying to contact people to see if I'd be able to go over to France and get an apprenticeship with someone. France is the center of the world for violin bow making. In the same way that when you think of a, of a violin, you think Antonio Stradivari, people who know bows, they think of a bow and they think Francois Xavier Tort who's a Parisian, who really did very similar things to what Stradivari did with the violin. The first person I studied with was a man named Benoit Roland, who had a very long lineage back to, say, 1850. I spent a lot of time working, gradually working through every process, repeated six times so that the memory would hopefully get into my hand. I stayed with him for about nine months or so. I was then accepted to go work with another maker whose name was Georges Teffo. I stayed with Georges for four years. At first it was kind of a relationship of a student and master, but it really got to where I was his assistant doing an awful lot of prep work for him. By the time that I was ready to leave Georges, I'd married the town bookbinder. We had a kid and we decided to move back here. I'll start roughing out the stick and bending it using dry heat over the corner of my table. As I look at this, I can see that there's not enough camber. Camber is the actual curve that's in the bow. 
So earlier in the process, I was using more just planes you might buy at the hardware store. But these are ones that I had to make before I could go over to France. The first person I work with said that you have to make planes exactly like the ones that I use so that the teaching will be very consistent. I'll make the frog, which is pretty involved, a little bit of, there's jewelry work in there, there's inlay, there's sculpture, and there's all the parts of it that are not just aesthetic, but that have to really function well as an object, as part of the bow that's going to make it a really top-notch bow. At that point, I never work on another bow. I only work on that bow until that one's done. I'm thinking about the musician that that bow is tended, intended for, and how I'm gonna maximize the potential of that piece of wood to be going along with what that musician has told me that they want for a bow. That will be involved in planing down the stick, getting some hair into it, taking off the last little pieces of wood, and really trying to make it as good as it possibly can be when I'm buying hair. It needs to stretch just a little bit before it breaks. It needs to be not very wavy, otherwise you're not gonna get a good, fine, consistent band of hair from the left side to the right side of the frog or of the head. People tend to prefer that it's really, really nice and white. If it's just a little bit off-white, to me personally, it doesn't bother me all that much because really the most important thing is how something sounds. That's rosin that's been powdered up and crushed. So it's just tree resin, the same type that would be used on the pitcher's hand so that he could hold onto the ball and uh, melts and works as just sort of a natural glue when it's melted into everything. A lot of people now use super glue to do those knots, but I really don't like that. To me, it's very much a disconnect from the natural order of things. What's wonderful about Matt is that he picks up on the, the player's cues, he watches you play, and can translate that into the mechanics of what makes the bow function. And so last summer, he started working on a bow for me, and I have it now, and I just love it. What I like about this bow is that it's very light. It's also very nimble, but they're stable when they're in the string. They remind me of the way the great French bows feel. They're just like butter. I have an awful lot of books, and you look at pictures of older bow makers, and I'll look on the table and say, hey, that, that's my tool. This is the exact same thing. Here's a, a picture that's 100 years old, and here's my tool, and I really find an attraction to that. It's really appealing to have a living maker making something of the quality of the classic, very expensive French bows. I also think it's cool that he studied in France, and so he has sort of this connection to the history of the great legendary bow makers of the past. From the Violent Society of America, I've won five gold medals that put me in a category called Or Concour, which doesn't allow me to compete in that competition anymore. And in 2011, I went to the City of Paris competition, and I was fortunate to get the grand prize of the City of Paris. To be going back to France and seeing those people whose opinion of me really does matter a lot to me, it was, it was just personally a very fulfilling experience. What keeps me going is working with musicians. You go see the orchestra and you think, I am a very small part of making this orchestra work well. One of the least important links in the chain, but still, I'm helping those really wonderful musicians do what they can do. Minnesota Original is made possible by the State Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.